we had a Facebook p- a post, and it was about um, you, it was a clip of you uh, about talking. What well, if God exists? Why is that baby? Di- why is that baby's dying of cancer? Oh no, this people, is not going to have gone well. Yeah, all these people couldn't get through their heads why the world can't be perfect, and they're all like, "Oh no, I." I would be happy in a perfect world because I'm imperfect, so I'd be okay. And these are grown men and grown women as well. But they can't, they, they don't understand it. It's like your flatmate. Your flatmate don't understand it. These people don't either. And they're, they're, they're accusing, like, they're, they're accusing us. <laughs> Bro, you're stuff. replying to, like, Sue Jones on Facebook. Yeah, on yeah. Facebook and her you're wrong. Stop the empty. having this. And the first thing you do, the phone is start <laughs> You're replying to old women on Facebook, lad. <laughs> Yeah, I I replied so I can sort of boost up the views a bit because I think I think a little bit and that's good. Um, but like, what did he put? That um, like you said there'd be like insults here. There isn't really just people saying that Steve from Brett guy was like, um, how arrogant to think we would destroy everything if we didn't have religious doctrines, which of course are, are genocidal, racist, misogynistic, homophobic, and slavery supporting. Wait, you said where did he say that? Um, it's on like the five uh if you had to sue Jones and you like put the arrow down. Right. Oh yeah, there's five replies. And that's for slavery then. Wow, that's quite an extrapolation. Jiggerworth J said, So your flatmate owned you then. I mean what I don't understand, right, is how people see something on Facebook like this and actually feel like they want to comment on it. But if something annoys you and which it does for them I don't, I don't think i don't think anything like a an instagram reel or a, or a video could annoy me to the point where i leave a comment i can actually take action on something and and comment on it i don't know like maybe it was just something hasn't angered me enough but no well it's all about who you follow with social media isn't it? yeah yeah i mean all, all of my reels all is a strong word but if i go on instagram reels it's all like positive hopeful content basically and there's a couple of memes here and there but a lot of it's just like um a guy showing his day in the life where he's being disciplined and he's going gym and he's like with some like motivational voiceover you know which is quite nice when quite I'm, good I'm, because i never go on instagram reels literally never because with tiktok it automatically comes up with reels you actually have to press the button into it mm. so i managed to avoid it and i think that saves me a lot of time and also i think i've um my, all my YouTube now is, is like podcast content. So I think that's quite healthy. Yeah. I to, to change that. So when I think about it, I'm how I'm spending my time on social media, it's pretty, pretty good. Yeah. Because it's, it's a very slippery slope for sure. Um, especially when I'm already a little bit tired or a little bit like burnt out, don't have the mental energy. Um, if I start, start going down those rabbit holes, it gets dangerous. But that's the battle within yourself and it's sometimes you win sometimes you lose i think you said that that ruins your day oh it does completely yeah yeah i mean i've i've started i tell you i don't know if i talked about this last time but i think i've told you is i've started tracking my mood every day for a video um like over long term so i'm going to track my mood for like 90 days and i give it like a score out of 10 and then a little few sentences about why that was the case and the days where it's low it's always because i got distracted like peace of mind gone um like i said they're here like the thir- 13th of october four out of ten lost the battle within myself and that's just all i put do you do you find like a pattern with those though is there like a certain time that you go to visit youtube because what my thoughts would be because i do it in the morning like a lot of the time youtube goes on and that's what the most common so if if i switch that by reading in the morning i think that can like eliminate it so i was just thinking could you do something instead of that if it was all in the same sort of time? Yeah, for me, there's two vulnerable times. One is meal times. So like a lunch or a dinner, I usually watch a bit of YouTube um, and then that can end up, you know, one video leads into the next and you don't transition then into the next thing you actually want to do, whether that's something relaxing like stretching or journaling or whatever, um, or, if it, or if it's something like working, but... I think the answer to that is, like you say, doing something different. I mean, I try and always, I didn't do it earlier because I was, no, I was having the Zoom call with you, but I try and have my meals in the kitchen in the flat now. And then if someone's there, I'm talking to a person. 
And then it's much easier to, when I finish my food, right, wash up, next thing. Uh, but the other thing also is when my brain is tired, like if I've worked on something quite cognitively challenging, like I've been um, trying to rewrite my notes from memory from uni or um, I'm scripting a video, after about 90 minutes, two hours, my brain just feels fatigued. And it's at that point where I should go and do something else. I should go for a walk. I should go to the gym. I should go to the kitchen and make a meal. But if I stay sat at this desk, I'll finish what I'm doing. And then I'll move to something easy, like easy dopamine, because my brain is just so tired. Um, so they're the two, two kind of vulnerable points. I saw um, a podcast clip that was pretty helpful for me today. It was a Lex Friedman one. And they were talking about um, how Elon Musk manages to be so productive because he is prob like one of the most productive people on the planet. And the methods he uses is he has his full 100% attention on a task for an hour. And then he will, he will probably go on Twitter and tweet something for like five minutes or get his energy out somewhere else for like a very short amount of time. And then it's on to the next thing in the next hour. And that's yeah. how he manages to be productive for 12 to 16 hours a day. Well, I mean, one thing that um, annoys me about uni is that um, it takes away my primary focus hours because a lot of my lectures are in the mornings. So my lectures are 8.30 till 10.30, 9.30 till 11.30. And then in an ideal world, I would get up, have a bit of caffeine and smash out two hours of good focus. But when you're in a lecture and it, maybe they're not talking about something you're that interested in, my focus can be wavy and then I leave the lecture and it's like I'm, a, I'm already into my day then. Whereas I'd love it if my lectures were like 2, two 3 p.m. Those moments where my focus dips and I have something to go to, different environment, different person speaking to me and I can use those morning hours to work. And that's why one of the reasons I really do want to go abroad next year and it kind of hit me like a ton of bricks when I realized it is the amount of free time that I'll have outside of basketball training, I can construct my day exactly how I want it to be. Mm. Like I can get up in the morning and go for a walk, like Andrew Huberman suggests, getting that sunlight in my eyes, get in the sea for that cold water, have a coffee by the beach, then go to training, or I can do some some work in the morning. And then go, like I will just have much more freedom. I feel like here, it's that I'm still in that schedule, morning school schedule. Of, you, know, you know, we all have that thing when we were at school where it's the night before a school day and you're just thinking like, Oh, I've got like double science tomorrow. Do you know what I mean? And you just you kind of dreading it. I'm kind of like that with oh, I've got a research methods lecture at half nine. Not really where I want to be. It's strange though that that the sunlight in the first hour is so important because um, I had Rick Rubin say basically the same thing as Huberman, and I I did it the other day when I woke up quite late and I had to, I knew I had a lot to do that day, so I, I went and shot. This is the first thing I did. And I came back and I felt like I'm very, very happy, like in a very good mood. And I, I'm, it's, it's strange that, but also um, it's weird. You talk about the 3 p.m. time. For me, I can 100% relate to that because something about that 3 p.m., like it's so easy to not do anything at that time. Mm -hmm. It's like, and why is that? Um, well, you're, so you know about your circadian rhythm, that 24-hour cycle that your brain and body goes through. Um, your attention actually dips or, or your, you start to feel fatigued and tired at around 2 to 4 p.m. It's actually been shown that, you know how, I mean, you can see it in other cultures where people have siestas and afternoon naps and in like Spain or whatever. Um, a lot of that is because your, your body goes through energy and, and rest and fatigue cycles and that afternoon does show a dip in your kind of physiological energy. Um, that's what we looked that's at a level. Thing. Yeah, 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 and and also you could argue also you're eating lunch, which will then put your body in more of a rest and digest state rather than a a fasted. I need to go out and and take on the world state. So, yeah, it's interesting. Can you just explain the circadian rhythm thing. So basically, your body has this 24 hour clock that's um, reset by light levels. There's a part of your brain called the suprachiasmatic nucleus that picks up on light um, to then reset the start of a day. And this 24 hour clock regulates various physiological mechanisms like sleep and wake. That's one of the key ones that people think about, but also your body temperature. 
um, and also hormone cycles. So when is cortisol released, things like that, cortisol spikes in the morning uh, when you first wake up um, and then it releases melatonin when it comes to, to going to bed and in dark light levels. Um, so yeah, I mean, our body is constantly trying to figure out and align our internal state to the external world. And that's why it's quite dangerous when people expose themselves to bright lights very late at night or they don't get sunlight in the morning because you're, you're not telling your body it's morning. If you if you wake up and you lie there for half an hour, an hour with the curtains still closed, your body doesn't know what's going on. Um, and that's why, I mean, as much as I've got these lights on now, as soon as we finish this call, it's like 6.30 right now, I'll put the red lights on. I'll have these, this red light, you know, low light intensity so then I can get to sleep better but yeah it's fascinating stuff and yeah just it's another thing that upsets me at times about living in this country is we're going to winter now every time i open my curtains because i get up about 7 7 30 every day it's dark so it's very difficult and that's why i have i have like these colored filters on my lamps and i have a yellow one which i put on in the morning and i just put it whack up to full and just hope that it it um kind of simulates some kind of sunrise but i don't know well, your, your bathroom door probably does. Oh, mate, my bathroom is so bright, it annoys me. That's why I have to, like, brush my teeth and go for my last toilet trip, like, a good while before bed, because it's just, it's just overwhelmingly bright. But those red lights, that could be quite tactical, actually. I love it. In between, it's like, sort of, in the evening, you're sort of, you want to dim the lights down a little bit, because then it probably aligns with the circadian rhythm. Yeah, yeah, 100%. So the red light, on you've got, so light is a spectrum, yeah? And there's a, the part of the spectrum called visual light, which is what we see. But red has the um, the largest wavelength of all the visual light. That's why the rainbow starts with red. Um, it's because it has like the lowest light intensity. So a red a red light or red lamp will not stimulate your 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 brain or your visual center as much. It knows it's getting dark now. Low light intensity. It's time to sleep. Then you just think about it. A sunset is red, isn't it? You know, so that's also another thing. But yeah, I love it, man. And people, people sometimes take the piss out of my coloured lamps, but I love them because it is more of a girl thing, I think. Well, having red lights. Well, that's how it's advised. No, no, not necessarily red lights, but having coloured lights. I've I've known much more girls to have red lights. Well, have you seen? Um, someone sent me this clip of a uh, Jehu Iman Gadji is. No. Nah. So he's like this like young millionaire guy who makes content or whatever. And there was a there was a re, uh, a short of him on a podcast, and they were saying like, um, he, he was talking about how he has red lights in his room and uh, in his house actually, his whole house. And about seven thirty p.m., they all just turn on, so his house just goes to red at seven thirty. And then he says, every time I have bring a girl back there, um, they think it's for some romantic reason, and what they don't know is that light has like the, um, is like the lowest on the Kelvin scale, and it makes me like release melatonin so I can go to sleep. And I was like, that guy knows, that guy gets it, you know? Wow. So the infrared wavelengths, how does that result in, like, how does that result in... Um, Better sleep. Yeah. So the red light, lower light intensity, your brain recognizes or thinks, it goes, okay, it's getting dimmer now, there's less light, it must be nighttime. And then the pineal gland in your brain um, releases melatonin, which is the hormone that then enters your bloodstream and initiates sleep. But mate, I've built a, a proper good bedtime routine here at uni. I don't use it every night because obviously sometimes I have social, sometimes I see people. But when I'm at the flat in the, in the evening, it's uh, it's pristine. I'm really happy with it. So I, I basically, I'll, I'll put my red lamps on. I'll go in the bathroom, brush my teeth, do my last toilet trip and that, get out of the bright light. And then I stretch for about half an hour. I'm going to put a podcast on or I just listen to evening music. Um, and that stretch just really relaxes my body and, and actually helps my mind as well. Um, and then I'll come to the desk, red light on, dim, do a bit of journaling. Then I'll read for 20, 20 30 minutes. I might play a bit of ukulele, do a little strumming about, just relax. And then put a podcast on and I'm, I'm asleep now within 20, 30 minutes, which for me is really good. Because beforehand, I could be lying there for an hour some days. Mm. So mm. your yeah, your last hour is very settling. Like yeah, like sort of yeah, and how opposite of a warm up. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a warm down, mate. Mm. Yeah, it, it fully it is. Um, yeah. So like, like I say, when I'm when I've got a, a calm night at the flat, which I like to have three or four times a week, um, it's nice. 
and I'm enjoying the stretching. I mean, it's something that that Ryan suggested for me for my legs, and I don't, I mean, I can't obviously feel any differences in my walk, but when I finish stretching, my legs just feel better. They just give me a bit of a thank you, just like what? I don't know what it is, but yeah, it just feels good. So. <laughs> Um, so going back to the the sort of three pm, I'm I'm visualizing in a in a, like a chart that the start of the day it goes up and then it sort of goes down and on the down it's the three pm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So what can we do to improve ourselves on those or on those hours to be more productive? Um, prevent the afternoon dip. I mean, I guess think about how you eat how you structure your your food routine um like i know if i eat crap at lunchtime my focus in the afternoon is gonna be worse if i eat good whole foods i will feel better i have more energy um just your general sleep as well because if your sleep's awful then you're going to feel that dip even more but the other thing is maybe you could realize okay so at this point of the day my focus is going to be pretty bad why don't i put my easiest tasks then why don't i go to the supermarket then why don't I go for my walk then? Because then you're not relying on your brain to have to do you know use so much cognitive horsepower when it's at its most fatigued. And then you know, I mean, for for people it might be different. Sometimes I work really really well in the afternoon. It just depends. I mean, just work with how you feel. But the reality is, what I've realised is, as much as like we're told by certain content creators that you should just hustle, 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 like. The reality is, I don't think you can force your brain to focus when it's fatigued. I don't think that's possible. I think the people that get the most done are those who tactically structure their time to kind of sprint, like psychologically, with what they're doing, then rest, then sprint, then rest. That's what product productivity is. It's like rather than the constant flow, it's more of a sprint and stop. But is that sort of what flow state? Yeah, yeah, because you can't be in a deep flow state for an unlimited amount of time. You can't, when people say to me, like, oh, I worked for six hours. No, you didn't. Like, you didn't work for six hours. You maybe got two hours of work done that time because your focus was all over the shop. I mean, seriously, I think, um, and that's why, yeah, I don't like that uni impedes on my, my perfect morning work routine because during the summer, when I was doing those two hours in the morning, I could plan a whole video in those two hours. Or like, like, from from start from idea to storyboard and then the next morning the two hours is the script that's the whole script done so i've planned the whole video in four hours if i had to do that in a day and you're like or i want you to plan and write a whole video in a day with shit focus that can take me eight to ten hours um I yeah it's very i feel it's very valuable though um when it when it gets to 3 p.m do go to the supermarket or Alternatively, pan a coffee. That's, yeah. That could be your second coffee. But the thing is, I I would I would be careful there, because then you're getting into the right. I've had a, I've had caffeine at three p.m. I want to be asleep at eleven. That caffeine's still gonna be in my system. I'm not gonna be able to sleep. That's for me personally, because caffeine is affects me. Um, so I have to be Maybe careful. Let's just be careful then, because today I've had I've had two hot chocolates and one coffee. My last one was about four o'clock. Oh, mate, you're going to be bouncing off the walls. <laughs> that could be a reason for the bad sleep. Well, I can scare you with a caffeine fact, if you like. Um, yeah. Caffeine has a half-life of about 12 hours. So that means 12 hours later, after you had your last coffee, half the caffeine is still in your system. And caffeine impedes sleep because it makes it... it um It inhibits the tiredness response that you need to fall asleep. That's what caffeine does. Like caffeine doesn't give you energy; it just stops you feeling tired. Right. But that that means if I have one at one one o'clock, then I'm not going to be. Then half the caffeine is still in your system at one a.m. Half. Okay. But if it's in my system, does that still have the effects? It will still have an impact on your sleep quality. But it's a trade-off, isn't it? Like I think about it. Like for me, I feel at my peak. 
after I've had an iced coffee from Starbucks. But I am at, my brain is firing on all cylinders. And if I have that before midday and I've had a day where I've been to the gym or I've done some basketball, I'll sleep fine. If, if say, I haven't exercised and I've had a coffee at 2 p.m., I'm going to be feeling it when I go to bed. Like, I'm not going to be able to shut off. Wow. Because I remember once, I didn't realize that Coke Zero had caffeine in it. And um, I was away at a basketball thing in Slough, and we were at Nando's. And I had, like, three Coke Zeros at Nando's. And then Colin was like, Joe, you do realize there's caffeine in that? And I was like, no. And this was, like, 9 p.m. I was like, no, no, don't lie to me, man. He was like, yeah, Google it. And I was like, there's like 30 milligrams of caffeine in it. And I'm like, that's a lot of caffeine. If I've had three of them. So then I had to, I, I just went to a random gym in the city. And I said, can I come? <laughs> yeah. I said, can I just come and train for a session? Because they didn't, I obviously didn't tell them. I've had three Coke Zeros. I'm not real to sleep. And they were like, yeah. So I paid like 10 hour and then I did a workout. I went back to my hotel and then sort of fell asleep after a, an hour. But if I hadn't gone to that gym session, I would have been pinging all night. I've got another fact about caffeine that you might have heard that actually might help you in your own life. Um, when you wake up in the morning, this is another one I got from Hugh Your the system that caffeine acts upon, your adenosine system, isn't active for 90 minutes after you've woken up. So if you get up at 7, having a coffee will have no effect on you until after 8.30. Because the system that caffeine acts upon isn't activated yet whereas your adrenal system is activated when you wake up in the morning so that's why it's better to have a cold shower or just cold exposure generally that gives you that first kick of energy that system's awake and then 90 minutes later you have a coffee sometimes i'll have one an hour later and i know i just won't feel the effects for half an hour but yeah that's that's a useful one like it's interesting as well because that means that when people wake up and immediately drink coffee the only effect that they're having is down to placebo because the system that caffeine acts upon is not activated yet. So it's not doing anything, it's just placebo. They say, don't they, not to have caffeine within the first hour of waking up. And I thought that was just due to, like, you want, you don't want to ruin your natural buzz in the morning. Because then you have to rely on coffee as the first thing. Mm, well, yeah, well, yeah, that's because the the system isn't activated that caffeine works on. But it's interesting that like, that is something that no one teaches you. I only know that because I'm a weird kid that listens to podcasts. You know what I mean? Like, no one else knows that. I, I just saw the last time that I knew humans going on um, Modern Wisdom again. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be good, man. Yeah. It's going to be good. Humans, actually, if, if you're if you're in need of some late-night sleep uh, podcasting, he's just done a series with a guy called Paul Conti, and it's like four two-hour podcasts. All, it's a series all about mental health. Really interesting. Right. Really, really interesting. Um, I've just, I'm only like an hour and a half into the first one, but the guy talks about um, like the structure of self and the function of self. So having a sense of self, what does that mean and how does that help us? And then he talks about the fundamental things for good mental health is agency and gratitude. So are you grateful for your life and do you feel in control of your life? There were some quite interesting takeaways I was thinking about as I fell asleep last night. I think as well, um, in in the conversation of productivity, I think um, urgency is something that accelerates productivity. Yeah, do you know something I literally did today? Well, I've got, um, I'll turn the camera around. Can you see, I've literally got a massive thing that says enthusiasm, which reminds me of oh, yeah. ethic, and then I've got 10-month renaissance. And my four main goals, get a contract, play professionally aboard, monetize a channel, publish a course, earn year one uni credits. Mm. And all of those have got to be ticked by the time I leave it. Mm. You know. And then every day when I'm working, they're there reminding me, you need to do these things. You know, Because once it's on a bit of pen and paper, yeah, it gives you that urgency, man. especially now there's time on it. And I, I know that I don't want to be at uni next year. So it's like, I have to get this contract. Well, I look around and the uni kids don't have much urgency. It just fascinates me. I, I mean, yeah. I think um, I was actually talking to, about this sort of with Dad earlier. We were saying how it's so interesting that a lot of people can go through their life without pausing to think about if they if what they do, does if what they do fulfills them. They don't question that, and they also don't question 
the complexity and weirdness of everything. They just keep going. But I can't just carry out a program. I have to stop and think, hold on, is this a good move? Is does uni make sense? I know it's what everyone else does, but this is doesn't maybe not maybe doesn't work for my life plan. Like maybe this isn't where I'm supposed to be. Now yeah, I'm an overthinker, but I don't know, it just makes me consider stuff. Well the ultimate urgency is that you're gonna die. Yeah. Yeah, man. I mean, yeah. It's scary stuff, like um because let's say you got four thousand weeks, like thirty odd thousand days, and we've used a lot of them already. You know, it does scare me. So I'm like, hold on, am I wasting a year being here? So, well, there's a couple of factors. Maybe you're not wasting it. You're meeting people. You're building relationships. Um, you do have some interesting things going on in your life. You do need to train to get a better contract abroad. Like, um, but yeah, I don't know. It's hard to keep death in your mind. It's really hard to keep death in your mind. Dostoevsky's story, he, like, he nearly got exe- executed and um, he got very, very lucky pulled out of it. And because of that, he then was very, he was very close to death. So he, he chose to spend the rest of his time wisely. And before that, he hadn't even written anything. So then he was constantly, constantly having urgency in his mind and he just wrote and wrote and wrote and in combination with that he um gambled he had a gambling problem but he would gamble all his money away so that he had to rely on the books as well to Mm -hmm. to um to make to to make a living from um so he he didn't even get comfortable and that's why he's his work so good but that's an extreme example of urgency yeah it's interesting that like you need a level of desperation to really like move the needle um yeah and that's why you see people who have like more comfortable starts in life they don't have a dog in them they don't have the fight and i feel that in myself i think if i was if i was in a more difficult position i would definitely work harder it's like tim ferris had this idea that if someone put a gun to your head could you work harder it's like yeah definitely who is Tim Ferriss, by the way? I, I, you mentioned him in YouTube, really. I don't know who he is. He's like an absolute OG of like the online education, self improvement, like sphere. He had like one of the first podcasts, Tim Ferriss. Show. Well, maybe not one of the first podcasts, but one of the first self help podcasts. He's also written very, very iconic books. Like, have you heard of the Four Hour Work Week? I might have. That's Tim Ferriss. That was like his biggest thing. Um, was like. He was the first guy to talk about online. Well, he wasn't the first guy, but he was a massive pioneer talking about online entrepreneurship and how people can like scale a business online and automate things so that they only have to work four hours a week. So that's what he says in, in the book. So eventually, you will only really have to work four hours. That was his pre- his premise was like you could you should re- this. He didn't like the idea of retirement as it is now, where you work for like 60, 70 years and then retire. He said, you want to build a business that can kind of run itself so you can semi-retire for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Quite interesting. But that book's like helped a lot of people. And then he wrote another one called The 4-Hour Body, all about fitness. And then he wrote another one called, um, oh, what was it called? Something of Champions or something. And it was like, he met loads of famous people through doing the podcast. And he like noted down habits that they all shared and then talked about it. So what well, interesting. Um, I haven't actually read the book, um, but I know he did it, and I know his podcast is quite big. But it'll be like the classic stuff, mate. It'll be the classic stuff like exercise and getting good sleep and just all that stuff. Um, I'm just looking up. There's a Stephen Pressel book you're talking about on your video. It wasn't The War of Art. Oh, Turning Pro. Yeah. 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 What's in that book? Amazing idea. I mean, it, it just... I, have you read Pressfield? I was going to listen to his audio book, but my subscription ran out. Mate, honestly, it's it's a cracker. Um, yeah, the, the idea of turning pro is that we all have things in our lives that we say we want to do, and we might do. We might do it, you know, make a bit of progress towards them. But turning pro means treating a hobby or something you really want to get good at as if you are a professional. Mm. So. 
dialing in all the tiny little details. Um, it's it's a, it's just a fantastic idea to, or way of thinking about things because it makes you enthusiastic about doing the hard stuff that no one the, the the unsexy things. You know, like for me, like turning pro as a basketball player meant that I needed to sacrifice lifting weights like a bodybuilder. Because even though those sessions are more fun, I love the pump, I love the potential for muscle growth. That's not what a professional wheelchair basketball player does. And like me focusing more on mobility and stretching and doing shoulder recovery work and all of these things, it's like they're not fun. They're not sexy. They're not scoring the three pointer buzzer beater or they're not shooting and scoring 30 points a game. They're not those big moments. They're the unsexy things that you do in the dark that no one cares about. Yeah, I like that iceberg analogy that you used. It's like only 20% people see and the 80% is under the water. Yeah, if you think about it, mate, like, if you think about it with a good example, it's like my A-level results. That's just the tip of the iceberg. Like, that's what someone hears and they go, oh, that's really good, mate, well done. Or like they see tests that I've, test results I've got throughout the year. What they don't see is like the weekend mornings where most kids are up at 10 a.m., but I was up at 7, working by 8 and studying till 10 pretty much every Saturday and Sunday unless I had a basketball game. Like, they don't see that. That's, that's what's under the surface. Um. So, turning pro, you you turn pro and, and that's by attention to detail. And yeah. How, how, is that the only reason how you switch something from a hobby to, to a profession? It's not... Turning pro, is, as Pressfield called it, doesn't, it, isn't about whether you get paid or not. It's about, are you taking the thing seriously? Like, if you're, he talks about the difference between an amateur and a pro. So an amateur says they're going to do a thing, might do it every so often, but isn't consistent. Whereas a professional, if it's your job, you turn up every day and you do it. Like, I can, if I was an amateur YouTuber and I just did it for fun, then I could make one video a month, not really think about it, just back the camera on and talk. But the pro has to turn up every day and make small increments towards it and think about the thumbnail design and make multiple versions and write a script and think about the B-roll that I use for every frame and think about the way we're going to animate text and think about you know, the, the, how the topic of the video relates to my audience and how it might be better to a wider audience and all of these things that people don't think about. Like That's why I don't like really talking about my YouTube channel with strangers or new people because when you say, oh, I make YouTube videos, they have this like, preconception in our mind that it's like me with a webcam on a minecraft let's play and the fact that the question how many subscribers do you have yeah because that is not a reflection of how much effort i put in no like I yes they're not the yes the thing was a lower now like yeah sorry about it. it's just like even though the growth isn't great now i feel like my work rate is so much higher than the growth um and that and gap i just have to put faith in that gap and be consistent what were you going to say? It's all like a, the equivalent for me. It's like, how many sales have you got? Yeah. Um, yeah, because people want results, mate. People want the tip of the iceberg. They don't give a shit about what's underneath the iceberg. They don't give a shit that you've tried something and it hasn't gone well. They don't give a shit about the courage that takes. They don't give a shit about how much effort you put into the website. They don't give a shit about all the, all the stress you've had about how much money you spent. They don't care. They want to see you making profit and putting more stuff out. That's what they want to see. They want to see the tip of the iceberg or they want to see you failing. That is yeah. what they want to see. So for me, it's like the tip of the iceberg is how many views you get, how many subscribers have you got, how much money have you made? That's what people care about. They don't care about, oh, Joel, how did you uh, decide on what colors you used in that thumbnail? And um, why did you make sure that your title was under 50 characters? And like, they don't give a shit because they're the tiny professional details that people don't think about. It's like when you watch a game of football, the average person, all you care about is how many goals has this team scored? How many goals has this team scored? They're not thinking about the players having to warm up their joints before the game. They're not thinking about how the players have tactically made sure that this player is in this position in this offense. They're not thinking about how the manager has rotated the team and made sure that he's rested this player for the Champions League game at the weekend so he hasn't played them against Burnley on Wednesday night. There's all of these different tiny features that the Gary in the crowd doesn't give a shit about. Gary just wants his team to win. Do you know what I mean? He just wants the tip of the iceberg. He wants the joy. He doesn't realise that there's so much underneath everything. Well, yeah, in terms of 
details i one of the podcast guys that i was trying to get on for this week i, I told you about I, I so i met with him he, he was someone that was interested in what i was doing and he's the only he's one of two people that i've that i've met and that owns their own business in the uni so out of the two years out of the whole of the two years there's only three of us that have got an actual business to our knowledge and bear in mind the other two are both second year so they have a piece of knowledge of that so this guy is making a lot of money on etsy and really all it is is a website um and a, a sort of a page and stuff but the attention to detail that separates his website from another website is crazy the amount of attention to detail he goes in it's like the weird ways that uh pictures have to be structured or like um how how everything communicates with you it's like the mixture between the urgency um of the message that pops up or that the mixture between the urgency and the deals and everything you're all trying to hook people in and it's like he's made these in incremental changes and he's like quite high levels up in this and he's gonna have to make more details to go even higher up and it's like that that's all the levels is mm. yeah there's so much complexity and depth to everything like i remember being a kid um and wanting to be a youtuber watching youtube videos that do really well and i'm not talking about the ones that like the likes of ksi or whatever make because people watch those because it's him I'm talking about the guys who make like faceless documentaries or the guys who the video isn't about them. They're just made, they've made a video essay about someone else. So there's a, there's a channel called Dodford that just basically picks like a celebrity or is most often an actor and he makes little mini documentaries on them. And like they, some of them bang, like some of them do really, really well. And like there is so much effort going into this that as a kid, I had no idea about when I see a viral video. Now that I make videos, when I look at one of his, I'm like, this has got to be hundreds of hours. Hundreds and hundreds of hours of work. Just on the tiny, quick, like the quick cuts, the tiny frames, the way he's color schemed things. It's just, it's just sensational. And I'm, I'm trying to get better. It's just like incremental gains in my videos, but there's so many little details. I think I'm getting better at thumbnail and title. I think I'm getting better at generating an idea and then generating a story from that. But I think one thing I need to, smashes intros now like i need to put just six months into like making really good intros because that's i think that's what hurts my channel the most is people just switch off quite quickly yeah i mean chris williamson is a great example of this and how he treated it like it was a sport yeah and he was saying on that video that you sent me did you watch it yeah yeah uh, he was good um he, he said about like he said the same thing about you with like he you studied youtube and like what is it with the 50 characters in the title is it just like people want something short and sweet yeah well there's two things firstly if it's if it's too long then it actually the vid the video titles cut off and you're left like a dot dot but dot won't that make people sort of he argued that it would make people sort of click on it and just want to see the full title but like let's say okay you want to make a video about um baking a cake right you can title it um three ways to make the best victoria sponge cake using raspberry jam and blueberries right that's title one or you can write this is the greatest cake you can possibly make and then the second one's much more exciting it's short it's to the point there's not too much waffle and detail you know it's like my video that just came out today i could call it the journey of how Chris Williamson grew a podcast from 300 to 300 million downloads from being a bullied kid and going on Love Island then realizing that's not what he wanted, right? Or I could say Chris Williamson, the new age podcasting psychologist. It just has more like, more intrigue to it. You want to know why. You, you, you basically told them the whole video in the title. That's not what you want to do. You want to just get them to click on it. Um, but the, another thing is, yeah, it just cuts it off if it's too long. It will just go into dot, dot, dot. But yeah, you want to create intrigue. That's that's the big thing. Yeah, mystery as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Like you, the, the title's function is to get them to click on the video. That's it. Like once you've got them there, then it's down to the intros keep them there. So have you seen good progress in that? Um, I told you, did they used to be longer? Um, yeah. I mean, if, if mate, honestly, like every time I get annoyed that 
YouTube videos aren't performing as well as I want them to, I go back six months and I look at my thumbnails and titles and I look at my, I watch the first minute of a video and I go, okay, we've made progress. We've made progress. That's all that matters. You know, even when you go back to my first video, like this is how far I've got in, what, 20 months? Where am I going to be in 10 years? Well, it, it's weird that because it's such a, it seems like a small thing, a title. I'm sure there's millions of ways you could phrase something. Yeah. And yeah, it's a very complex thing to work on everyone's psychology in the right way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I heard, um, there's this channel called Film Booth. It's absolutely amazing videos for anyone who wants to grow an audience or just make better videos. Um, and he, he said that an intro, uh, not an intro, a title, the most important thing is intrigue because you want them to click on it. But the way you do that is through two things, fear, fear of missing out and curiosity. They want to know what happens next. They're the two things, fear, curiosity, and they create intrigue. And it's all those tiny little details that people don't think about. You know, you don't analyze why you click on a video, but yeah, it's baffling stuff. Great fear of missing out. So like you could say someone. So for example, one of my videos that has done the best of any video recently was a video I made and the title was, um, your intrusive thoughts will end with this video, right? If someone is struggling with their thought patterns and they see my video that says that it can end by watching this video, they will fear not watching my video and continuing to feel the way they do. So they, they're, they're scared. They're maybe they're scared that. Um, if I don't watch this video, I'll continue to feel bad. This might help. And they're also curious, wondering how I'm going to end their intrusive thoughts. And that's why people are like, stay to the end to watch this. To get the payoff, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that. Wow. Well, the thing is, fear, fear of missing out I, is like a very powerful emotion. Like, I, in different contexts, I'm... Um, one of my flatmates is like, "Oh, I'm, I'm, all, I'm, I need to go out tonight because I have big F O M O." Well, no. And also, well, when I was when I was, like, been studying like research on clothing brands recently, and one of the biggest um successes is in their marketing, they create a big fear of missing out. Yeah. It's like, why is I, I I can understand why from from a perspective, it's like. But but then if you're not satisfied by the end of it, would that decrease the fear of missing out? I don't know. It's just weird psychology. Mm. I think um, well, generally people just want to, if someone else is having a positive experience, you want to have it too. Just universally. Um, what I found, I've, I've managed to kind of, I used to feel FOMO a lot back in the day, but I think, what you have to do is you have to go to the things you were scared of missing out on, realize it's not that great, and then you're scared less. And that's one thing. Because, okay, I'm scared of missing out on, for me it was, oh, I'm missing out on the party scene of young people. Okay, I went a couple times, realized this is shit for me personally. Don't really do it anymore. And I'm fine with it. But so, like, I heard, um, who was it? I was talking, who was it that said this? Um... It was, oh, it was actually, I was listening back to the podcast we did with Ryan when he talked about, you talked about him sacrificing his social life when he was focusing on sport during uni. And he said, um, the more you win, the easier it is to sacrifice. So, like, whoa, that's nice because you've got that positive feedback. So like, I had the little nugget that now that, you know, a year ago, I'd never had a video get a thousand views and now I've had multiple get a thousand views. And I've got one get two and a half thousand. And I'm like, can I get 10,000? And, and then it's like, that's it. That little positive feedback of all little win. Right. I can focus on it more now with basketball. Right, I had a good game here or I got into this team. Okay. Here's some, I'm winning now. I can sacrifice more. Yeah. hundred percent. Cause you justify the sacrifice. You justify the missing out. You're not scared because you know, you're doing it for a reason. I think it's, it's what I've, it's um, it's about what you value as well. Yeah, and I, it's interesting to see why people value what they do, but I think one one is well, like you said is being good at something, um, and then you get enjoyment, and then you'll value that and prioritize that. I think it's kind of like a compound effect. 
Yeah, I, I think you only really fear missing out when what you do doesn't really fulfill you existentially. If you're doing what you genuinely love to do and it, it fulfills you to the core, you don't give a shit about what anyone else thinks you should do. And people who fear missing out, I think they're the ones who don't know what it is they want to do. So they want to try everything. They feel like they're missing out because they haven't found their thing yet. And um, I'm not saying I'm completely immune to fear of missing out because I get it sometimes, but in those moments where I wonder, should I be doing X, Y, or Z? It's like, nah, because I actually love what I do. As much as like, it's difficult. I do love what I do. And that's why I'm not that worried about sacrifice or anything. No, I think it's one of the hardest things for, and it's one of the most important to find what you like as soon as possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To find what you value as soon as possible. Yeah. Uh, how did you find that? Because I'm trying to think about it myself. Of like, yeah. How, how how did you find what you value? I have two ideas that are in my head. One is, um enthusiasm again like what what makes you enthusiastic genuinely not like what do you enjoy the results of but what process do you get enthusiastic about and like what like i say fulfills you deep within the core what would you do if you didn't need the outcome of doing it and that's the key one because if someone if that's playing sport or if that's painting or if that's reading or whatever just somehow you've got to build your life around that and the second thing is, I was actually thinking about this today, about how the most important question, one of the most important questions you can ask yourself is, what do I want to want? Not what you want, because we want thousands and thousands of things. What do I want to want? Um, and I can't take credit, that's obviously what I've got from Chris Williamson, but what I want to want, well, I want to want self-growth and peace of mind and positive relationships okay and because i want those things right what what do i have to do to get those things well, i have to have my mental and physical health in order I have to sort of make enough money so i can just function and live in the world and i need to care about people and help people right that's it i mean that's a, that's a great question that people can ask themselves don't ask yourself what you want because i want a bugatti but I don't want to build my life around getting one because there's no point. It's not worth it. But, you know, I want I want a big house. I want to have massive biceps. But do they really matter? Like, what do I really want to want? Well, I think people look first idealize it yeah. as what results do they want, like you said. But I, I heard um, Stephen Barlett sort of twist this and it's like, instead of what sort of life or what sort of values do you want it's more it should be more what pain can you endure mm. so like is for me the there is more pain in more like going through the normal processes of the system and stuff and then getting a normal job that is more painful than to be trying something now and going through the pain of failing Hundred percent, mate. Absolutely, yeah. What are you willing to struggle at? Like, what are you willing to work so hard at and get no material results? Like, I ask any people that you want, like, could you put the hours in I've put into my YouTube channel, do it for a year and nine months, and only be on seven hundred subs? Could they do that? I don't know. I don't know if they could. Maybe I'm just insane. Maybe I am. But the reality is, somehow I've managed to push through the struggle. Somehow. Same thing with you. Like, you could survey people. Would you be willing to spend five figures on a clothing brand that you know will be, that will be unsuccessful, and then you have to figure out a way to save it? People don't want to do that. No way. No way. You know? Um, well, pain's just an illusion. What do you mean by that? Yeah. Um, 
and nothing's good on bad thinking just makes it so exactly man all the greatest moments of my life have come out of pain yeah you know like it's struggle a yeah you keep you build a character exactly and they're the best conversations you have with people are about pain you know Goggins said and oh, he's saying like that's when you find your true friends yeah yeah 100% when you open up you're vulnerable and you talk about your pain but Goggins said he said like I don't need to to figure out what it's like to be happy because everyone can do that naturally you don't have to study that he said I study the dark times I study the darkness because other people don't want to go into the darkness. I'm like, well, that's, 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 you know, when I wake up at 6.30 to go to the gym before my lecture, I'm like, I'm studying the darkness. Um, I heard uh, Jordan Peterson recently say that um, happiness is, in the, is extroversion minus neuroticism. Extroversion is kind of like a how do you how comfortable do you feel in your social circle? How comfortable do you feel in the things that you do? And neuroticism is yeah, what's your baseline anxiety? You don't want happiness in your life. You want an adventure. That is like that goes against I reckon the whole population. Yeah, yeah. You ask people, what do you want from life? I want to be happy. You don't. You don't. You want an adventure. You know, just like we were saying last week, if everything was easy and perfect. You wouldn't want to be here. You want struggle. You want an adventure. You want to be, watch The Lion King, right? You want to be Simba. That's who you want to be. You know? But you, you want, you want serious struggle and loss. And you want to be, um, what's the word? Like, banished from your kingdom. And then you want to come back and defeat evil and be the king. That's what you want to be. That's what you want your life to look like. And right now, mate, we are in the trenches. We're struggling. We are, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine, the guy that um, I was spending time with on Saturday. Um, and he said, you know, he's, he's, his life's okay, but he's not loving it. And I, I just said to him, you're the hero. And right now you're training. This is it. This is the, this is the, the chapter in your story where things are tough, man. But you'll, you'll get out of it and you'll be a hero. Like the, the Rocky montage in the film is like two minutes. But in real life, it might be a decade. You know? But wouldn't it be nice just to be happy? Why do you have to be fulfilled? Because happiness isn't strong enough. It just isn't. It doesn't last. It doesn't sustain you through the difficulty of life. Happiness is not enough to really find meaning. Because dogs are happy, right? Because they don't have self-consciousness. They don't have a sense of self. Human beings, happiness, happiness can get you through a day, but it won't get you through a lifetime. Because there's so much suffering and pain in the world that's unjustified within you, within the people you love, within everyone. We are fundamentally exposed to so much evil and, and death and loss and regret and self-hatred and self-criticism and fear. And happiness just is not enough to fight that. Just not. Whereas an adventure makes it all worth it. So, happiness doesn't set you up for the down times. No, because where's happiness when you hate yourself? Where is it? Where's it gone? It's not there to keep you if through. If you're happy, then you won't hate. Yeah, but mate, find me someone who doesn't have moments where they hate themselves. Find me someone who doesn't have moments of pain. If we could be happy all the time, it wouldn't be real. You know? It just doesn't you think about you think about heroin addicts. They're chasing happiness. They're chasing a high that doesn't last. It's it's not it's not meaningful happiness. It's nice, but it's not meaningful. And that's why, yeah, just 
Just be the hero, man. Be the hero. And you have to be a fool first to be a hero. You know? So, yeah. As much as we might get trashy comments on the podcast clips and as much as my YouTube isn't where it wants to be and your clothing brand isn't where it wants to be and we're still two pretty valueless 18-year-olds floating through a university we don't want to be in. Yeah. We're the fool right now. But when, when, Jacob, when we're the hero, when we're sat 30, 40, 50, we will listen back to this exact episode and we will hear ourselves now. I will hear myself say, Joel, this is it. This is your adventure. And then we'll, we'll look back on the choice and we'll be like, was it worth? Yeah. Yeah, maybe, well, maybe, maybe it is better to just chill out and be happy. But We've been through before that I can't do that and you can't do that. I can't, I can't pretend to be okay with out pursuing this adventure that I feel like I'm on. Mm. But say if we're wrong, like it's kind of annoying that we can't try out both. (laughs) Because how do we know if we're right? Because you only get apparently one, one knife, but it's like, why can't you? You have to, you have to cut. You can't go back. It's like an abyss. Do you know what I think wrong looks like, Jacob? Wrong looks like oh, crime. Ever. Yeah, wrong looks like not doing the thing. If I make content for ten years, and I still am making no money online when I'm twenty-seven, I've done it for ten years. Then I can turn around and go, Joe, you did a thing for ten years that no one else asked you to do and you have thousands of hours of inspirational content that has affected people's lives that's a win and worst case scenario I'll just be an athlete or or just be a psychologist go back to uni like there's no really it's like what the worst what's the worst that can happen like oh it doesn't it doesn't go how I want it to go okay carry on like i think about also how late a lot of people hit their big big break like jimmy carr went on rogan and, and modern wisdom recently if you haven't listened to those episodes mate they're phenomenal i've listened to the rogan one not the modern wisdom one. he talks about how he up until the age of 26 worked for shell you know the petrol company and then he he had quite a comfy job he graduated from cambridge worked for shell and then he gave up this comfy job at Shell to go and be a comedian. And for 10 years, he just struggled through doing hours and hours of shows to small crowds. And now he's our country's biggest comedian, potentially. You know? Like, maybe this is just our 10 years. But 10 years is a long time, so that's why it's difficult. And that's why no one wants to do it. 10 years of failings, so maybe if you YouTube still ain't good in 10 years that's your 10 years of failing and you should make that that uh, the 10 if i'm if i've done it for 10 years and i haven't seen significant benefits from it then i will that then i'll stop but that's the rule i made to myself is 10 years you gotta do 10 years you know then i'll start thinking about other options i'll be late in my 20s family settling down will start to kind of arise in my mind so do you reckon you'd want to just sort of maintain your YouTube? Say if say if it goes quite well and you're and then you're sort of hit forties, fifties, will you still be doing it then? Do you reckon, or will you move on to the next thing? Because I know you want to write books and stuff. Mate, YouTube is a is a very like until I don't need to do any more thing. So the ideal is to have an audience and an email list from the content I've made over a decade where I can make the money I need to make and the impact I need to have through, instead of making videos, just writing and speaking. So I have tour dates that I put out of where I do small speaking shows. I write books. I might write a newsletter. I have, I'll have online products, including my books and stuff. That's the ideal way. My dream work is to do two hours of writing in the morning and a speaking event in the evening. But that's just, that's amazing. And I think it's doable. I really do. If I put 10, 20 years into it, I think it's doable. And then I've got the whole rest of my life to do that. I mean, imagine, mate, 
this people have experienced this, but imagine the point where you've completed money. Just imagine that for a second. You have enough money in the bank or in the stock market where you don't have to work again ever. Wow. I mean, that is just... that is, Just even thinking about it is like the biggest relief ever because then the world can't really touch you. If you want to go and live in the forest, you can. If you want to write a book that no one reads, you can. If you want to write music that no one will like, you can. If you want to write poetry, you can. If you want to just have a family and be a great father, you can. You can do anything. Yeah. The wow. priority, the how you spend your time would change a lot. And I think you'd, you'd prioritize family and you prioritize probably making the most different. Mm. Um, like helping others make it. Yeah, because you do, you wouldn't need it anymore. There'd be no need for me to do anything. It's all out of joy and out of love and out of support for others. And that's the dream, man. It's just, and it, I, I really do have this belief in me that it's doable. And I feel like other people pick up on that as well. Like, they either think I'm a dickhead or they respect it. You know? And if you ever to write a book, are you still thinking you want to do that in your mid-twenties. I suppose it depends on how everything goes, I think. But what? As, I soon think... As, as soon as the opportunity opens up, I will write. Mm. If I can make a sustainable income from the channel, um, making a video every two weeks, I'll do that and I'll write on the side. I, I think it's a great thing to do, but that's like a whole another new challenge in itself. But... Yeah, I need to get to a point where I do what I love for a living first. Yeah. Um, and that might take another five, ten years. But I'm willing to, mate, because I'm enjoying the adventure. Like, I feel like you have faith it's going to happen. And I also, what was interesting is speaking to that friend of mine on Saturday who I haven't really spoken to over the past few months because he moved away. He just said to me, Joel, I know it's going to happen. And for someone to just turn around and talk about your goals in such a certain way is amazing. He was just like, yeah. yeah. I'm not familiar with this person you interact with. It was Bartek, the one I took him to Nottingham. Oh, okay. oh wow. Yeah, he, he was just like, Joel, it's going to happen. I can just, I know. I don't know how you're going to do it, but it's, it's, it'll happen. And I was like, I just felt emotional. I was like, thanks, man. Like, even another friend that I've got who's like quite cynical and he always takes the piss out of me. Um, I remember on the phone the other day, he was like, yeah, I know you're going to get there. I was like, what do you mean there? She's like, I just know you're going to get there. Where you're headed, I just know. I was like, damn, like, that's amazing. It's amazing, like, that I've got self-belief for my goals, but when other people have belief, then it's like, I better go on with it, and then I better do it. Like, Because of that consistency, yeah. Like, that's it. Bartek seen me work for two years on something that hasn't seen much growth, and you can see it's going to happen, and he just sees my life philosophy. And it's also like, I think, I think there is something to be said for genuine encouragement. Like how it can affect someone is so unbelievably significant. Like this summer with basketball, getting told that if I keep doing what I'm doing, I could be at this point in 2028. It's like, for someone else to say that to you, it's like nothing else, you know? Mm. And that's why I have, I have, I want to say to you now, I have similar feelings of, I don't know where you're going to be, but you're going to get there. I don't know what there looks like, but I know you'll get there because you won't stop because I know you. If you were going to stop, you would have stopped by now. And whether that's building your own company or working on the podcast or working in my business or whatever it is, you're going to get to a point when you're comfortable with the work that you do and you're happy with your life. It's gonna happen, mate. It's just, it just will. I mean, it's what we've committed to. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's no going back. Even because my whole sense of self is around this now. Mm. Like success is just consistency and quality. Yeah. Yeah, consistency and iteration to try and get slightly better. You know, zero point one percent better every time make a slightly better video, make a slightly better podcast every week for the rest of my life. 
make a slightly better book, write a slightly better sentence, be a slightly better father, be a slightly better husband. Like, I, yeah, it's just, yeah, like, like, oh, I've got so many. This is, like, this is the stuff, this is the stuff I love to talk about, mate. Honestly, this is like, this is my how, life. How, how would you be a slightly better husband and a slightly better father every day? You build a, you build that relationship, I guess. Like, I don't know, man. Like, I just think as soon as I I found the one and I have kids, like I'm gonna put the same dedication I put into work as I do my relationship with them. And they're not just. I don't want it to get to the point where I'm so used to being in that relationship or I'm so used to having the kids around that it becomes the norm. And I don't think about it. Like, I want to still take my wife on dates when we're like fifty. Like her life, her life is still gonna be a rom com. And I'm still going to be my kid's hero when they're, they're growing up, you know. That's very interesting. It's like you can, when you spend time with someone, it can just be another thing that's the same or you can make it better. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like think about, think just think about friendship as well. Like you have people that you see every day and you might have a little joking conversation with them. But like, do you ever sit down and go, mate, I fucking appreciate you. Like, no one says that to other people. No one sits down and goes, you made my life significantly better. Thank you. Because it's awkward. But honestly, if you did that, it, change, it changes people. Well, I think I, I remember um, on my birthday, <clears throat> my dad's writing me for my 19th. Like, he wrote me like a fat paragraph. And like, one of the things that was in there is like, I, I'm, he told me that he is proud and I think that was very impactful because it's like now I can die just just knowing that he was proud of me and that's important for because he actually said that mm. yeah and I, I don't like how there's weird social norms about it's awkward to tell someone that you appreciate them um, and also that like words like I love you you say them so much like you would just say it at the end of a phone call to your mum or whatever, they, they lose their meaning. It's like the word sorry, it loses its meaning. But when you tell someone and you tell them you love them and you genuinely mean it, it's just amazing. Yeah. I just want to figure this thing out. I still haven't really got my head around like how I can be a better father and a better um, husband each time. Because what's the difference between um, so, sort of doing this is it sort of the same thing or is it venturing into something else to be better or is it just sort of the time that you spend and to me it's building that relationship it's every little interaction taking it seriously and wanting to put your best self out there and it's like it's like that idea of building a mountain out of layers of paint every day you just put another little layer on and after 50 years you've got something beautiful you know like and just being intentional with the way you speak to people, what you say, what you do. It's just so easy to like take shit for granted. Like take your partner for granted, take your kids for granted, take your friends for granted. When really they are the infrastructure of your life and your mental well being. And they should know that. You know? And on the point of taking stuff for granted, what I was thinking about the other day is like the passive thank yous that you say to like, you, um, a parent or something like there might be uh, I, may, maybe a year ago I would be sort of in my room and I'd come back and my mum would do something nice for me and because it happened fairly often it would just sort of be a passive thank you but it's um, but, but I think you, I, I could probably have reacted to that a bit better to mm -hmm. make to make To make her acknowledge that I appreciate her. Exactly. Because a lot of the times we say things like, thank you, sorry, I love you. Because that's what you're supposed to say, not because it's what you want to say. Yeah. But what if you, like, your mum did a thing for you and you just went, you know what, mum, like, thank you so much. Like, you don't understand, like, I really, really appreciate what you do. And it's like we've talked about before, when someone asks you how you are, you say, fine as an automatic response. We don't take a moment and be like, I'm doing fucking great. I actually used my first fantastic today. Yeah, yeah. Good, mate, please.
you know and also like I, I love answering someone's question with another question because it kind of shocks them then and we have a little playful interaction you know just like the girls the other night that wanted to lift down to the key they were like are you busy and i was like what do you mean by busy like that's just a good response it's just good isn't it instead of going yeah or no it's like what do you what do you mean by that exactly well how are you giles like what do you mean by that how am i, I don't know. i'm all right thank i feel great I like that. yeah like what do you mean like joel how's your day going i don't know what does that mean like what do you mean my day do you mean how i feel or what i've done or like what does that mean i've noticed you do that quite a lot actually <laughs> or just ask what things mean no it's good it's good i remember there was a time um when we were at now i i i don't i i look back on this and i'm like i i should have i fucked this interaction up <laughs> so basically it was me and you and sophie and the other girl and we were um i think it was las iguanas and oh what and that talk- at that um Oh, yeah, that cocktail bar with those three, like, oh, mate, yeah, that was an interesting night. Yeah. Okay, carry on. But, but I remember, um, like, we were talking about men, and then you were like, um, but, 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 but what is a man? What does that mean? Yeah. And, like, I reacted to do it normally, as a normal person would, and I should have took that and then made a better conversation out of it. I like that's you. a very specific thing that I remember, but it, it bothered me that I didn't do that in hindsight. Like, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, these are great questions. But, but, I just, but that that could be just sort of how I've changed over like a year. But. Mm. I mean, people people think it's like overthinking and crazy when I say like, like people go, are you hungry? Like, what does that mean? Like, it's not like, people just want you to say yeah or no, but I actually think things like, hold on, but I don't know what that actually means. Like, Joel, are you smart? I don't know. What does that mean? Like, what do you mean by smart? Like, or do you feel tired? I don't know. Is David Goggins tired? Yeah, but he carries on. So I'm all right. Like, well, yeah, man. teenagers always complain that they're tired. Yeah, it's, it's like the, the most common, it's, it's almost most more common than saying I'm good. Yeah. And you ask, when you, how are you? Oh, I'm tired. And it, and it makes it a little bit more interesting than the good. And that's so I think they, I think they subtly put it in so that, <laughs> oh, t- I, I'm, I'm tired. So it's a little bit different, but it's not. It, yeah. It's just, what are you supposed to say to that? Oh, go bed then. <laughs> and then you start talking about sleep. Because what else are you supposed to say? Yeah. Yeah, maybe you should just say, maybe, maybe life's tired of you, man. You know what I mean? Maybe you need to give life some respect. And 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 then, what? okay, what I'll start doing when they say, oh, okay, I'm good, or okay, I'm tired, I'll be like, what do both of those mean? <laughs> what does good mean? Yeah, exactly, mate. This is it. This is it. When when people say, I say, how are you? They go, I'm good. I'm like, okay, what do you mean by that? Give me a score out of 10. And then they give me a score out of 10. I go, okay, what's a normal day then? All right, nice. So you're a score above or you're a bit below. Okay, nice. Yeah. You know. I love. I think that's a conversation hack. I've got another conversation hack for you that I was actually talking about today with this girl on my course. Um, so sometimes what I'll do is someone will just talk, say something to me and then you just don't reply. You just stare at them. It's quality, mate. It worked on her so well today. Because she she was like talking to me and then I just made eye contact with her and I just went. And then she kept talking. It was brilliant. And then she was laughing and that. And, and, then, and then she did it to me later on in the day. I was like, well worked, well worked. But yeah, just like interrupt the program. Like make someone see that you're different. You know? Yeah, but the fantastic thing well, is just it's... something that everyone can do. I think it's great. Or just like, just when it's someone just goes, like how old are you? Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, it pauses, mate, hundred percent. Just because, all the little things. Because the pause. Everyone always says, "Oh, there's a pause there." Yeah. I remember, like, when when I, when I talked to, I think it was you and Sophie, um, Stanley's girl, and and she would always mention the pause because I'd actually think about her question and take like ten, like thirty seconds. And, and like, yeah, people notice that you're taking that pause, and they're like, "Oh, why is there a pause there?" Yeah. Yeah, and then they're they're anticipating what you're gonna say, you know. Well, now that's it because the pause actually creates suspense. Yeah. It creates... Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't know why I'm getting so excited talking about dumb shit like this, but it just I don't know, man. It gets me fired up. Well, so okay, I was gonna say um another something that Robert Greene says is um 
uh, apparently people find it quite seductive. I I find it annoying personally, but I think it's more girls finding it seductive. Um, when um, say someone's talking about like a subject, and they ask a question, you you don't re you don't reply literally, and you don't re you don't ask. You basically completely change the the topic a bit, sort of similar to like you ask a question us, but it's like totally unrelated, and apparently that's like seductive because like you're in control or something. So they might be talking about, for example, it's like, um, oh, um, how how are the new headphones? I don't acknowledge that question. I just immediately ask them, um, why are you wearing the other? Like yeah. I think what people really want when they interact with you for the first time is, is this person just like every other stranger or there's something interesting about them? They're, they're looking for a program interruption. Like when someone, like if, if I meet a stranger in the future and they go, oh, what do you do for a living? I'm going to say I'm living the dream. Because that then it's different and it's also mystery because I haven't told them what I do. When someone asks you, what do you do? They don't give a shit, really, about what you do. They don't care if you're an accountant, or you're a teacher, or you whatever, right? They're going, just give me something interesting, please. Like, please, just let's have a good conversation. That's what they're really asking. So let's give them that. It doesn't matter if it's not true. I'm living the dream. How about you? I'd be a good thing to put in for us because, I mean, you, I know you say it already. But if I was to list, like, if we were to list out, it would probably take, I like that. I'm living the dream. How about you? I'm going to respond to that. Yeah, no, it's amazing. Oh, I'm living the dream too. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah, well, then I'll be like, what does that dream look like for you? You know? Mm -hmm. but yeah, man, it's just, verbal acrobatic is so, it just, it just, I just love it, man. I love being able to speak. This is why I love the podcast so much because I don't really give a hot shit that no one listens because for me this is practice which is life and the the way that I can verbally jump from topic to topic and the way that I can formulate sentences with big words and just yeah man it just wow we haven't turned pro yet uh, and it, well, we, we're not ready to but I think um it will help because um there 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 is a sort of benefit um the, the, when you become more of a public speaker, I think this is very good practice for it. Yeah, and mate. maybe I will as well. Especially, I could, you know, do public speaking even business related. But I think, yeah, both of us when we do public speaking, I think um, it's, it's very good practice. I mean, have a think about how you were that first day when we recorded the episode that never even went out. But just think about that. Think about the first day when we did that first episode that never even went out. Think about how you were then. Oh, yeah. And how you are now. In the space of what yeah. three months? That's crazy. Isn't yeah, it? Exactly, mate. Yeah, where are you going to be in ten years? Yeah, you don't know. The thing that like we learn most about, I learn more more with talking to people than I do sort of reading a book. Yeah. Like talking to people is probably the the best way you can learn something. Because talking's active, isn't it? Like reading is passive. Reading is observing what someone else has said. Talking, when someone asks you a question, you have to really think because you have to, those those thoughts have to amalgamate together and formulate a whole new sentence that you have to then produce for the other person to digest. So it's not just, I looked at a, a sentence and it didn't go in my brain. It's like I've had to generate my own sentence to explain something. You know, it's like when when you went into that lecture of mine about how to learn well, and the guy said, "You don't learn by learning; you learn by testing yourself on what you know." That's what you're doing with small little tests. When you ask me a question, I ask you a question. We're posing each other a test. Can you can you complete that test by generating some kind of answer? Yeah. In my flat, there was um we we do these things which is like I I normally start it when I'm bored. I just basically there's like a fridge whiteboard and i just like write shit on there sort of like how you are about big chalkboard mm. what i do is i like i i, I do like a list and there might be a couple of people in there with me and i'm like all right let's rank everyone in the flat in, in terms of something and i did this one and it was a bit 
people didn't think it was very nice. But I basically <laughs> said, let's rank everyone based on intelligence. And there was quite a few people in there. And, and it was like, they were getting, like, actually pissed and offended. <laughs> but I, my point was, I don't mind. Like, no, m m my point was, we were all in this uni, so we're all somewhat intelligent. So you shouldn't really care too much about how you rank. Yeah. And, and they put me at the bottom because apparently I was I, I was being a dick. But, like, they, they don't care that much. Like, um, but I, and then this girl, she, she was like, okay, where do you think I rank? And I'm like, well, I, I was like, who's dumber than you? And she was like, <laughs> and then she, that's why I went at the bottom. And then she was like, okay, tell me why you're more intelligent than me. Um, and she was like, oh, I can speak three languages. And I'm like, I mean, in my head, I could probably prove it to her. And she was like, I know you have a podcast, but like, yeah, uh, that is a lot. That is a lot of intelligence I'm getting from the podcast because I I can go into a lot of depth about a lot of different subjects just because of the people I spoke about. And I don't think you could do half that. So <laughs> that is that is the amount that like the podcast is actually because think about it, right? We the amount that we've learned in the last couple of months, I've I've got a basic understanding of psychology. Well, so some parts are a bit deeper than others, so I can keep up in a a lot of psychology. Um, I've learned a bit about neuroscience, a bit about politics. I've learned lo loads about religion. I knew nothing about before. Um, a bit of theology. Um, and then we've done, you know, all these different things. Like, it's like how Joe Rogan can, can, can talk about anything and have, and contribute something like that. that, that that's impressive. Mm. Yeah, mate. Yeah. Something's happening right now. In my life and in your life too and it's exciting and um the moments where i wake up in the morning and i struggle to motivate myself or the moments where i lose the battle within myself those are the times where i should remind myself of how i feel right now and this is why i love our conversation so much because it just it just fires me up to be alive it like skyrockets my enthusiasm just for being I mean, I remember, like, always as a kid, like, some of my favourite part of being year seven, year eight, and year nine were the deep conversations and the sleepovers. Yeah. And we can have those. Every week. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, man. Um, and it was all so exciting is you do, we don't know where we're going to be. I mean, so many different dimensions of my life change in like a six, three to six month period all the time all the time things pivot and change so joel and jacob in january won't be joel and jacob today it won't be joel and jacob when when i move abroad and stuff like just everything's going to change but what i know is you're you're such a solid friend now and the podcast means that we will talk at length every week mm. we just will yeah i mean there's nothing that would I don't think there's a valid reason that we can't maintain this consistency. No, wherever I am in the world, wherever you are in the world, whatever we're doing, we'll come back on an evening every week and just have a natter. And as in some ways, like I like, I do like having guests on. It's interesting, but I still feel like I get fired up the most when I'm just talking to you. I think, yeah, yeah. I think the ones with us two are needed. And um, like, I'll be honest, like, you you were massively helpful last summer because no matter what was going on in my life, we met every week, we went to the sauna, even before the podcast, we would sauna, go gym, whatever. But it was those conversations we had in the car, or like when you come to Worcester with me, and those conversations we had in the car, it's like, you can't pay, that. there's no amount of money you can pay for that. Like that that's so valuable. Yeah, and, and I know I can tell you about any difficult challenge I've faced in in my work, in my mental health, in my relationships. I can come here and I can talk about it. And I don't think many people have a friend like that or a person like that. Mm. I, and um, the days in the summer that I spent with you doing the podcast were the best days. Yeah, there was something I look forward to. Right. And it's perfectly done so that it's like once a week. So it's not too consistent, but it's something to look forward to. It's like 
great balance. Yeah. Yeah, man, I'm excited. I think um, the future's bloody bright. But with, 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 with the guests, though, um, have that we've done so far, have they benefited you, do you think? Like, have you taken stuff away from them? Yeah. Mm. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think um, I really enjoyed um, Philip coming on. Mm. I really enjoyed the Cole episode. I enjoyed when we were in Anil's house. I enjoyed Riyadh the other week. You know, just someone... Someone who's got something to them, I can just tell, like, this is interesting and good. Mm. I still get fired up after those ones, mm. you know? And, and like, yeah, the one with um, Riyadh, like, it, the sort of way he's impacted me is, like, now I'm, like, very interested in Nietzsche and Dostoevsky just from this conversation with him, and I've looked into it and stuff. So it's, like, these people, I mean, they are having an impact. Yeah, yeah and then... Think about it, mate. Like, how many people we can have an impact on? Like, me and you will go out in the world tomorrow and have an interaction with at least 10 people for a significant amount of time. And if you do interrupt the program, tell them you're living the dream, tell them you're fantastic. You know, how much impact can that have on them? Like, yeah, it's, it's a good marker how you're doing in your life if someone tells you they value you for... Just the way you are. I mean, it's just, it's the best compliment you can ever get. That someone feels safe and joyful and fulfilled around you. I mean, that's, that's all you can ask for. Mm. Um, but, yeah, I think I need to get a bit of practice in about interrupts in the program though, because I think it takes like, not confident, it takes more thought. Well, it could be confidence if it's to a stranger to interrupt the program. I think you just have to, um, it's just a thought, isn't it? Because most of the time we're... It's about being mindful rather than someone give you something, you say thank you. It's like they give you something, there's this mindfulness gap in your mind and you go, thank you so much, I appreciate that. Or like, instead of when you go to go to like the coffee shop at uni, instead of just saying, oh, can I have this? You go, morning, how are you? Like those tiny little things, like good morning, how are you doing? Good, fantastic, I'm living the dream. I'll have a nice latte, please. I probably should do that as well because I get asked so much. So, so they might be, think a bit sort of, oh, no, not him again. But then, yeah, they might actually look forward to it if I stop. And that's a small thing, isn't it? Like, if you can have a, a really positive 20 seconds with someone, like, they'll see you again and be like, oh, it's that guy. What you sound? Really? You know, everything. Um, everything's an audition. And, and it goes back to the, um, if you're not, literally that clip of what Riyadh says is, um, to forget about the outcome and to forget about how can I work this conversation into the direction that sort of um, that that's most aligned with the other person and and in reality you should disrupt it yeah. Yeah. just don't try and make reality fit your cookie cutter idea of how it should be just go out into the world, tell the truth, and act the truth. Your truth. Mm. But, but that's, it's quite a change for me because I've always been quite good at aligning with other people and understanding sort of the understanding quite quickly the way they are. So then I could communicate in the way that they'd sort of want to. So it's going to be quite a big change to sort of to disrupt that and to to speak the truth but i think i've got over it a bit slowly but the truth can still be compassionate it's not like going against what the other person wants it's just you know when you go into an interaction you still want to give them a positive experience so it's just doing what you can for that you know like it's not like it's just not completely being inauthentic to fit someone else's model of who you think they want you to be you know, it's just be Jacob Matthew. Don't try and fit their model and don't try and act like you're someone you're not. You know? Yeah. That's great, man. Have you got, have you got any? No, I think we're in, we're in terms. There's a small fear that if we did a thousand episodes, are we going to run out of stuff to talk about? No. 
Nah, because because Jacob, me and you are going to change so much. Okay. Yeah. If it was Joel and Jacob at nineteen, doing a thousand episodes, but Joel and Jacob at twenty, twenty five, thirty, they're going to be so different. Like we're going to have families, we're going to have different jobs, we're going to be in different parts of the world, we're going to have had so many different experiences. You know, there will never be a time where we run out of things to get enthusiastic about, my friend. I suppose there's an infinite amount of words and stuff and that. Mm. There are infinite conversations to have. And scenarios. And I'm excited to get a few of them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, decent, mate. Have you stopped recording yet? I will now. I had a 